Hey, everybody give it up for our tech guru, Ethan Klein. Holy shit. Yes. We are live. Yes. We are live. Welcome. Hey, dude, can we turn on the auto switcher thing? Oh, sure. Cool. It's only going to switch between <laughs> guests for today. But... It, it's only going to switch be, be, between what? Yeah. All so the bells and do, whistles we'll must be activated. Yeah, we got to activate all the bell, bells and whistles. Hey, uh, welcome to episode number 104 of the motherfucking podcast. This is, of course, the official podcast of the International Power Rock Combo, motherfucking ruckus from Denver and Chicago, respectively. I'm joined by, uh, of course, my good friend here, Cousin Freddy, not to be confused with the mascot for a certain world-famous uh, new wave of British heavy metal band, uh, Schmeier and Schmaden. <laughs> I'm also joined by our tech guru, Ethan Klein, who has been sitting here swearing at the computer okay. because I messed something up because I took the computer home. Okay. Swearing at the computer. Can you get the other guests on there? That should be all of the guests. That should be everybody, and yeah, it'll it it'll just rotate, rotate between the three of us. Twenty seconds. Cool, and then I and then I can click on people. Yep. Technology's great. Uh, hey, wait, let's start it. I think I forgot to start it. So we're we're playing with uh <laughs> we're playing with the green screen on this episode, which is super fun. <laughs> I'm in space, um, but Gordo, my man Gordo, who you all know know and love, is in the actual for real studio. Like he is yeah, not in. He's yeah, not in front of a green screen at home. Not at all. Not at all. No, I'm I'm right here with you guys. Actually, <laughs> I was closer before. Now you're in space, so uh, I don't know. We keep we keep missing each other somehow, but we'll get it. We'll get it together. I know. I know. We uh, we we like we've been complaining and complaining about how we haven't been doing this in the same building, and then I have to fuck off and go to space for the episode. Uh, I would like to introduce my guest this week. I'm very excited to have him on the show, and I appreciate his patience. Um, please welcome to the show an old acquaintance and friend and colleague and a hell of a musician and a hell of a good-looking guy, and his Skype icon looks like a model in a fucking jacket catalog, and uh, that's that's a pic. They can't see it at home, obviously, but... Your your icon is a picture of you leaning against a castle in Europe somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bel I like to go to Belgium to lean on my castles. Um, <laughs> I don't. I, <laughs> I don't know. It, uh, yeah, if you're summering in Belgium and you're looking to take some good jacket photos, I recommend leaning on their castles. How do you not fuck that? How do you not fuck that guy leaning up against a castle? I don't understand it. You know, uh, I think it's hard to fuck guys against castles. <laughs> I I know, man. They're sturdy, but they're really old and they fall into disrepair. No, you, you know? Yeah, those ones are. That one was falling down. I'm pretty uh, sure that's not a fucking castle. Well, please welcome to the show, uh, old buddy, um, a a national treasure, a gem of a musician. Uh, from the band Authority Zero, and before that, Wire Dogs, and before that, White Leather, and before that, and I was stretching my brain trying to remember this, but it was Letters to the Front, right? Letters from the Front. Re letters from that, the Front. And then before that? What was before Letters from the Front? <laughs> the Snobs. The Snobs before Letters from the Front. So a guy who is, <laughs> a guy who is steeped in rich... Um, local Call music. Lore. Yeah. Please welcome to the show, my man Dan Aid. How you doing, Dan? Uh, I'm good, guys. How are you? We're doing well. We're doing well. Yeah. Doing doing the best we can, all things considered. Making um, it through. Yeah, man. Hey, uh, by the way, you guys don't know each other, and you met briefly, but Dan, this is uh, this is my producer and co-host from the band Granny Tweed and Gordophonic Records. And uh, his solo artist name, his solo stage name is Gordon Leadfoot. Please welcome to the show my friend, Gordo, Jason Gordon. How you doing, buddy? Hi, from the next room. I'm great. So, so Dan, I got to be honest with you. Um, yeah. I, I sent you a text when I was leave, leaving the house, realizing that I had failed to reconfirm with you the night before, because that's you know important to reconfirm the night before. And so I sent you a text and I was like, I was like, I'll bet the fact that I didn't reconfirm 
he probably forgot that it was going on and is trying to summon the words to be able to let me down easy. And so we need to prepare just in case he doesn't text us back. I was like, I was like, man, you know, these musician types, man, well, they're all, I, I get why you think that because I believe, uh, I have canceled on you for this three times. <laughs> no, uh, twice. Yeah. Twice, and all with oh, good twice. reason. All with okay. good reason. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I get why maybe uh, your brain um, thought that maybe I wouldn't be available the third time. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to be prepared. It would stand to reason. Yeah. I wanted to be prepared. And yeah. so, so we started playing with the green screen behind me. Um, yeah. because we're like, we're doing this total like merch liquidation sale thing where we're yeah. like trying to unload all our merch so that we can pay for music videos and stuff. Cause like many of our friends, we are not going to be playing shows for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah. you know, not, not for quite some time. And, uh, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to make some, uh, some ad videos. So I was setting this up so that Ethan and I could make our own like QS QVC video. Okay. Like I was going to do a bunch of cheese ball introductions to like merch items that we had. I thought that that would be funny. I, I was yeah. thinking about doing like a, like a deal and Doug type of thing and, and yeah. doing like a, a little short ad like that. And then you called me back as I was grabbing merch out of the trunk of my car <laughs> to bring it back in. And I had to be like, Ethan, he called. Quick, get inside. We got to set everything up. <laughs> so, and then, of course, I've been, I bought this computer from Ethan. So I've been at home, like, basically bashing this thing with a rock like a fucking caveman trying to figure out how this computer works and all the, all the tech. Yeah. And so I brought it back to do the podcast. And Ethan is having to unfuck everything that I did yeah. <laughs> okay. at home. So well, I appreciate glad your you patience. Have an Ethan. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I'm I'm glad you have an Ethan. Is is that like the new the like the latest Apple's the Rock Edition? <laughs> it's the Ethan, the new I Ethan from Apple Computers. Yeah. Everyone yeah. needs one. You gotta you keep them in a shed somewhere. Gordo, I think it's great that you've just got the it's, fucking that your background is the studio. It totally does look like you're in the you booth. You can't say that I'm shirking my duties, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm right here doing the thing. I love that you I'm, just happen to have a picture. Wait, wait, of that. wait, wait, wait. Could you test one, two? Test one, two. Okay, <laughs> that, that's good. It's perfect. So, uh, so Dan, tell me, man, how, um, yeah, how's how uh, the the question that everybody is answering right now? How's it been for you? Like, how have you been affected by everything that's going on? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I think like most people at first. Uh, one of the weirdest days for me was realizing that sort of my world was actually shutting down. Um, so uh, this year started for me uh, talking with the band guys about actually taking some a step back from touring because I've uh -huh. uh, I've been having some opportunities uh, in the acting world and I wanted to pursue those. No fucking <laughs> and, way! Uh, Can you talk yeah, about them? Man. Can you talk about what yeah. some of the things you're doing? Yeah. Um, well, last year I got cast on a TV show on Showtime called Smilf uh, and I had a recurring role on that. And um, and then wait, what this show? Year, it's called Smilf. So what's a Smilf? A, a Smilf is a single mother I'd like to fuck. Oh, it's a single mother. Yeah. They couldn't just call it Milfs because they're like they're like. Like, well, no, they are all single. We're not we're not making a television show about home records here. This is lifetime well, after all. We have a or showtime. Was well, it lifetime or showtime? Showtime. It's showtime. So <laughs> big difference between lifetime and showtime. <laughs> yes. There's a lot there are a lot more dongs on showtime than lifetime. Um, so yeah. I played the the love interest in the second season of that, and then I got cast in um the newest season uh, that just end that just wrapped up of Good Girls, and uh, get the fuck and out of here. And had a recurring part on that that uh, ended up just being one episode because they shut down production on that, like they did. Every, um, so yeah, hopefully I'll get to come back in season four and keep working with them. But then um, I was also just out in LA, like right as all this was happening, I was in LA 
shooting a film for Hulu called Tentacles as part of their Into the Dark series. And um, is that like like is on that on one that of those too. um uh, uh, HP Lovecraft shows that they're that that they're putting together, or is that someone else that I'm thinking of? I think it's someone else. This is part of this would be the second season of Into the Dark, which is basically the first season was a, a series of feature length films that then they released as kind of like this anthology or a season called Into the Dark. And they're all right. horror films and um, uh, with different directors and different storylines, and uh, they're not connected. But um, so, yeah, it, it's been interesting in that, um, like, I geared my whole year towards doing this towards acting and writing and uh and then my whole sort of la hollywood world shut down as well so um that's a double whammy man fuck yeah it was not the greatest day to realize that all that because all that kind of happened within like 72 hours um but one of the great things that's come out of this uh probably the best things come out of this is that uh um my girlfriend and i maddie uh, had started dating like three weeks before all this started. <laughs> and then, and... <laughs> gotcha, bitch. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we were like, li- so now like, it was like, well, now you're living together. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, what I think's been cool about it is, obvi- is I think we were both nervous and that we knew it would present uh, some challenges. But what's been but what's been awesome is just sort of figuring out what that actually looks like and like building relationship in a time when you don't really get to build or further other relationships to have at least one relationship to get to sort of put energy into feels really good. And to get to care for somebody else and to get to just at least have one other team member to sort of funnel energy into and then also have like someone to sort of take care of you and to um fucking like tell you you're pretty in fucking quarantine dude i thought you were just gonna say and fuck like i thought you were gonna stop right there it was just like you know someone to take care of you and fuck fuck no i think no i think that's important too i think i think during quarantine like it's really important to like like creative time has been really hard for me but the part of my brain that like really needs to just like eat food and go for a walk outside and like and fuck like all those parts of my like those parts of me are going and i think that's important right now like because i think there is sort of a survival mode in all of us that's kicked on and like a lot of that is like eating and fucking and like that's fine and we should it's all that do maslow's that. hierarchy of needs shit come to life you know what i mean like everyone yeah, is yeah, taking yeah. care of their li- literally their base needs you know it's like get back Absolutely. to basics you know what's important and um, and I mean, just even having your person there, like uh, uh, our drummer uh, Ty, his sister um, is separated from her husband and their kids. Like they have kids together, you know, and she's separated from them uh, because they're observing yeah. social distancing. They've been they've been apart for over a month. And I can't even imagine how, what kind of state I would be in if I was unable to hug and kiss my, my wife and my kid every day. Oh yeah. And then to go from being a, a, in a parenting situation where you have a partner doing that work with you to then be parenting on your own, especially during a time when you're trying to figure out doing home, doing homeschooling and, I mean, talking with – I'm a I'm a godfather to two young boys and talking with the parents the other day about just how it – like it's been really nice to have so much family time, but also it is on. It is like you never get the break and you never get to pass the kids off in some way, whether that's school or daycare or to let someone else take them for a play date or to the park. Right. Like, like yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. And I mean, like, we have enough trouble at home with respect to – I'm the only one working right now. Unfortunately, my job has been deemed essential because I work in food service. 
and yeah. we do we do takeout and and you know it's just crazy busy right now for anyone who's doing takeout because people are you know limited in options to a certain degree so it's 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 really they got flooding to get them wings they, they got, got to get, get them wings yeah but um it's hard enough like going to work and coming here once a week to do the podcast and things like that where she's at home all day with a one-year-old you know i can't i can't imagine like being forced to stay apart during this time yeah. you know it's yeah and i don't think that that is something that we're particularly used to or prepared for in modern the modern developed world yeah well and and right now too like I think uh, I would imagine for you or like when I go to the grocery store, people whose jobs are have been deemed essential and they are still asked to come into work and to have work in one respect. It's great because we're a society that's set up like we we need money to be able to pay for things in the society. But it's also got to feel hard, if not every day in certain moments during a time of pandemic to be asked to go spend time around people all the time. Right. Like. That's crazy. Uh, it's, it's tricky. No, oh, man. Yeah. So are you are you so, in De- are you in Denver right now or are you in LA? I'm in Denver. You're like in I Denver. wasn't I w- I was in LA. I was in LA and then I and then I, like I'm getting on the fastest flight out of here I can before they <laughs> before anything else gets shut down cuz stuff was starting to sort of shut down. Right. And, it's like um, a fucking apocalypse movie, dude. It's like, it's like, kick yeah. all the money out of the bank and get yourself to the airport as fast as possible. We got to get out of here. The government's yeah. getting ready to get overthrown. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. With any luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, one could only hope. Um, so... But have yeah, you, I'm have, in Denver. Have you been keeping up with uh, any of your... Um, your people from the production world back in LA. Have you heard anything about about what that's looking like? I've been super curious about what the what the production world is looking like in 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 major markets like that. Yeah, so all the major studios shut down production and canceled the rest of the seasons. So, so all new all new production or continued production was canceled. So like Good Girls just ended on episode I think eleven. And the, and the season was supposed to be 16 episodes because that's what they'd shot and they could sort of edit and they could piece together an edit of that episode to make sort of a cohesive story for that. Right. Um, but the but the producers of the show just were just uh, released an interview, I think, yesterday with Entertainment Weekly and said that they were basically going to pick back up season four kind of where those plot lines ended and and just keep rolling from there so i'm guessing i don't know i'm guessing that the rest of that world will look similar it's like it like um so i'm watching i'm watching ozark right now i'm on the second season of ozark and it's such it's such a fun show right i mean so good okay it is good and and I know I'm gonna get I know I'm just gonna get absolutely pilloried here from my my friends. Oh man, who are super what is he about to say? What are you about to, what are you about to say about? <laughs> what are you gonna say about the TV show I like? Don't um, drag down my favorite show. No, I, it I love the show, but is it just me or does it seem like a little deliberately over the top? Like I have no second idea what you're season. Talking about. <laughs> It's just I will the, say the whole the show is a little intense. Me, oh yeah, it's way intense. The second season for me, like the first season, I thought was just sort of perfect and hit all the notes I wanted it to. The second season, the sophomore season, it was good, but I I don't know that I loved it as much. And now I'm on season three, and the stakes have gone up even higher, and it's fucking great. I mean, it, it it's so, a fun uh, show. Yeah. It's a fun watch, and I really enjoy it. And I, you know, I love my stories. It's dude, great. But and they nail Missouri. They nail it, dude. <laughs> That's got to be a part of it that you've like got to know Missouri to like to get that aspect. Trust of it. me, they nailed it. 
Well, and if I mean, you don't, but I'm from Kansas, so I'm biased, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't, and if you don't know Missouri, it's a place that's really worth taking time to get to know, and you know, go lean against some castles and take some pictures, Missouri. <laughs> Um, so, so like, but what, like what I was, what I was talking about is like, you, um, like you watch the second season and you can tell there's a break between the two seasons and the child actors in the story have aged a fair amount between, uh, production schedules of the show. Right. But now we're getting ready to go into this, like unprecedented gap in production timelines Mm -hmm. and so when we come back to shows there's gonna be shows like yours that pick up in the middle and it's gonna be like you know like pick up in the middle after like 18 months to two years off and the kids are all gonna be grown up and they're all gonna like people are gonna have like crow's feet and like people are gonna like have aged substantially and it's just gonna be like what the fuck happened to that guy like that guy was like Aaron, let me hip you to a device, okay? Okay. Creative device. Two years later. Uh, (laughs) Every show. Every Every show. show. It would be hilarious if every show would just (laughs) went to two years later. Two years later. Every show started out with two years later. Dude, every every show right now, like every screenwriter and like every everyone who writes for sitcoms and writes for dramatic series and writes for movies is trying to write that right now. They're like trying to figure out they're like, OK, now how do we plug the global pandemic crisis into this storyline that we t- like we did not plan for at all? Hopefully they're listening. Yeah, they're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, they just happen to be two listening to later. this podcast going, going, oh, yeah, fuck, uh, two years later. Fuck, what happens? What happens? What happens? What happens? Yeah. So the answers yeah. are out there. You just you got to listen to the MF Ruckus podcast. Yeah, that's right. So um, tell me a little bit about because now that you're mentioning it, I remember hearing that that acting was a move that you had made. So yeah. tell me a little bit about what, what that looked like, how you made the transition from being a guitar player in, in a punk rock band to getting into acting. Yeah, so, well, I grew up acting, um, doing theater stuff. Oh, cool. I think I think when I was like fourth grade, I started doing um, productions just at my school. And then when I got into high school, I was in the drama program and did plays and then would also do these summer intensives. I did one through the Arvada Center one summer and then did a camp called Perry Mansfield up in Steamboat, which is like this six-week program and um, d- uh, went and did a branch of the New York Film Academy out in L.A. and took some private on-camera lessons. And then right out of high school, uh, I went. I moved to New York and uh, start started studying acting at NYU. And so that was sort of my... At that point, when I was 18, I, I left Letters from the Front in Denver and 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 basically chose acting instead of music. Huh. And moved to New York like, without like without a guitar, which was a huge fucking mistake. And um, and yeah, and what was weird though is I fucking hated living in New York, and it kicked my ass so hard that um, I bas- I didn't do anything basically for 10 years and then when you say you didn't do anything what do you mean you didn't do anything well, you mean like sorry, you literally didn't, didn't do anything or you like just bummed around and partied or <laughs> just bummed around for, uh no well, to, to i just degree, ate potato no, chips for 10 years and, and then here i yeah. am leaning on castles and shit <laughs> that's how you get there it goes from potato chip <laughs> you gotta eat potato chips for 10 years without no you can't inhale and that's the trick and then you get the castle. Um, it's Missouri state law. But anyway, um, so yeah, they eat a fuckload of potato chips in Missouri. That's for sure. So yeah, yeah, then I, I, I basically hit up my friend Lynn Andrews, who we'd gone to high school together, and she'd kept doing acting. She was in a like the national and international touring casts of Annie. She played Miss Hannigan and um, had done done a bunch of theater stuff, but she'd moved to L.A. And gotten a manager, and and I'd hit her up asking if I could pick her brain about uh, getting back into the acting world, and um, 
and I actually forgot to call her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing a pattern here. <laughs> yeah, potato chips and don't call anybody back. And then, yeah. Um, but I got a call one night, uh, and, I, and a couple missed uh, voicemails from her manager who had a role come across his desk, and she told her manager about me, and he thought that I might want to audition for this. And the first role was like for some uh, army vet coming back from Iraq or something for some NBC show, and I didn't get that. And then the second thing he sent me to audition for was Smelf, and I booked that. So um, then he signed me, and and I've been auditioning for a bunch of TV shows and movies for the last couple of years. That's crazy. Like for for some reason, I thought it was a it was a fairly recent thing. But you've like almost had more experience in theater than in in playing with bands. Like bands is kind of your like playing guitar is kind of your secondary avocation. Oh, it was weird. Like at one point, I think that was true, and then bands took over for pretty much all of my twenties. That was that was my creative outlet, and so now it's interesting hopping into my thirties here and being, you know, just. I think as a little kid, I wanted to like be an actor and like be a musician. And so in my thirties, I'm trying to make all my twelve-year-old dreams come true. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I I made I I made a similar choice when I was very young. When I was probably seventeen, sixteen, or seventeen, I did one of those because uh, I was a I was a theater kid too. I went to. Um, Denver School of the Arts and I was in the theater yeah. program there although I barely went to class like I was more interested in punk rock shows and chasing girls and being being a piece of shit and so you know just an overall piece of garbage and um and so that's what I focused on but I did go do uh one of those showcases in in LA that the that all the agents get together and they come watch you like you're a fucking, you know, an animal in a petting zoo or something like that. And you gather yeah. up business cards and I collected a bunch of business cards and I, I had arranged meetings and I went out and did a uh, shoot for, uh, you know, headshots and all that and met with agents and, and got everything lined up. And then it came to where I had to make a choice between moving out to LA and pursuing that or, staying in Denver and playing in a punk rock band with my friends. And yeah. it sounds like you probably made the right choice. I mean, for me, like, well, it depended at the, it depends at what time you're talking about in my life. Like at, at many moments for like 15 years of my life, I chose playing in punk rock bands over fucking doing a lot of other shit like my band has always been my priority and then all of a sudden and then all of a sudden we lost uh <laughs> skype <laughs> and, and then, then all, all of, of a sudden... sudden oh wait wait are you there oh motherfucker what we lost we lost him on skype, skype. Oh, shit. <laughs> he still he still looks like he's deep in thought though that's the important thing no no yeah he's just thinking oh, really he, hard there he is, there he is. Right we there. got him yeah yeah cool i think i was still i could i could hear you guys the whole time okay so we we we, we lost you at we lost you at all of the sudden and then all of the sudden we were in suspense oh yeah yeah so so uh it was interesting basically having this opportunity to tour and and be in authority zero these last four years and to get to do all of these musical things that I'd wanted to do forever um, on 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 a sort of a different level than I'd been able to experience before or create for myself before as far as touring and 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 putting out a lot of records and um, and then sitting there and also realizing that like as much as I love playing punk rock and I love being in authority zero and I love that part of my life that I was still curious about mm -hmm. these other passions of mine. And I really knew that like, if I didn't try to do, to, to do acting again, that I would really regret it. Right. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I feel really fortunate to have the backing of those guys, like 
authorities, the guys in authorities here have been so fucking cool and, um, and helpful in, um, in helping me like create space to try this world. So, so, Um, so how did, how did that discussion look like you going to them and saying that, because because they, now keep in mind for people watching that this is before this is before any of the pandemic stuff hit. So you're like just going to them and having that courageous conversation and going, hey, I need to take a break or slow yeah. down on touring so that I can pursue this thing. What did that look like? Well, it was like it was many, many conversations. So the first conversation happened when I booked the first TV show because uh, we had this Euro tour and then I was trying to figure out how to shoot two episodes of this TV show around that, which basically it looked like me flying to Boston, shooting like for three days, shooting an episode of this TV show, flying straight from Boston to Europe, doing six weeks of tour in Europe, and then flying straight from London back to Boston and shooting another episode, like the day after I landed for three more days. That's insane. And so that's how, like, that's how it started. But what it created, so then for the next year, it was us trying to figure out how for me to be on tour, but then also be recording and sending in auditions and trying to figure out how basically the Hollywood wor- world works and touring world works. And the reality is over that last year is I think we all realize that like they don't make room for each other. Like tour needs you now and you have to plan it and you have to go. And Hollywood says, fuck everything else in your life Right. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't show up tomorrow, like we'll we give it you, to someone we, else. Like, yeah, we need you tomorrow. And so, while I don't necessarily love that, that's the way those two worlds interact. It's meant that I sort of that we decided as a band, we sat down and revisited that conversation and said, well, why don't you take a year and pursue acting? And what was really great is that um, Brandon Landelius, who was the guitar player that I replaced in Authority Zero, happened to have some time where he could say yes to coming back in and doing a couple tours. So um, that's really cool that they just have this, um, I don't know, amicable, role, like revolving door relationship with their present and, and former bandmates. That's really great because you hear about people kind of having a bitter falling out but it sounds like they have a very sustainable idea about maintaining relationships with people in their band. Is that, is that something that you've experienced? Yeah. I mean, I think Jason, who's, you know, at this point he's the only original member, but I think in my experience of him in all of his relationships is that he works really hard to keep everything amicable and it pains him. I think whenever things aren't, um, so, yeah, you know, I felt really, uh, it was real. those conversations were not easy to bring up and not easy to have, but I felt really uh, happy that we were able to have them. But now what's weird about this year is that we've made this plan and now none of it is very actionable. Yes, so, none of it, n- none of it whatsoever. Like the Hollywood stuff is not actionable. Yeah, Touring with Authority Zero isn't isn't actionable. Like, like yeah. tell me, tell me a little bit. Like, can you help to quantify specifically what you are losing out on in 2020 due to this, due to the global crisis? Oh, um. <laughs> well, I that mean, good, huh? I mean, I don't know. I guess because it sounds like a couple of shows, right? Like a couple of television. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, so in a certain world, like if I wanted to, like, I, I don't know, but like, I guess I don't really like. I think it's a good question. But in a certain way, I think for my own like mental health, where I've been trying to get to with this whole process is like, I'm I'm probably missing out on like a quarter to a third of my annual income of gigs that would have happened during that time. Oh, or really? This time? Yeah. Okay. Um. But. 
now the trick has become figuring out what to do in the meantime. So like knowing that like these opportunities are not available to me has created space for um, a buddy of mine started a nonprofit a few years ago called Musical Mentors. And okay. they opened um, and they started operating in New York City and London. And now they're sort of expanding. But um, their mission is basically to connect um, children uh, who have a passion for music and want to take music lessons and learn an instrument with instructors and instruments and kids that don't have resources to um, purchase lessons or instruments for themselves. Um, musical Mentors provides those things. Shout out to Musical so, Mentors. Look it up. Yeah, it's it's way cool. And so I so I'm uh, I just signed a contract with them to teach five students over, like once a week over the next three months, and um, and it's really cool in that um, the majority of kids right now that Musical Mentors is working with are um, in the foster care system or living in shelters. Um, with I believe over fifty percent of uh, the constituents um, uh, identifying as queer. Um, so it's it's created space for me to step in and be part of something like that that would have never happened otherwise. And um, so so, in so, that so way, how, how many lucky. how many of the students, what percentage of the students identify as queer again? I, I believe over fifty percent of the kids that are currently working, um, which is which speaks to um, uh, Teddy Pohl, who is um, one of the administrators at Musical Mentors, has been doing a lot of outreach work, um, trying to engage with homeless youth who are interested in this program, and um, particularly he's been talking um, to shelters that work with uh, queer homeless youth. Okay. In New York City. Right on. That's really cool. So so that that was a deliberate thing. It didn't just end up being that 50% of the students that were attracted to this happened to identify as LGBTQ. Uh, yeah. It, it, it happened. It, it's something that they deliberately set out to do. Like that was a, yeah. a that was like a like a secondary or tertiary part of their of their overall outreach campaign. That's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. So are you doing all this online? Are you working with students online? It's all Zoom, which for teaching guitar is, for teaching any instrument I think is really hard because there's a lag and sometimes like the internet connection at someone's facility that they're, or uh, wherever they're trying to have Right, it's not lesson. great. So like it, it's the, super pixelated or you'll lose things or like the audio, like the, the audio coming through whatever device they have to utilize. Um, it's, it's tricky. So it's int So what's become interesting is how to spend an hour with a child in a mentorship capacity. Um, Cause some of it ends up being music and some of it ends up just being spending time with them. Right, right. That's a big part yeah. of it. Yeah, it's yeah. I've I've done instruction, and well, I don't do it now. Like I, you know, like I teach guitar a little bit, and uh, haven't really figured out a good way to do it over this medium, you know. And and some of my students are uh, one of them in particular is a uh, he's like an audio production student, and so it's like we could we can do some screen sharing things, but that's really not the same as like being in the room hearing what they're doing you know and like yeah. being able to tell them like how to make these adjustments or do what they want to be able to do and it's yeah it's super it's, well and the, 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 the technology right. is moving that way you know you have these things like jammer and nin jam and jam kazam and all these different things but you know your ping time is is going to be limited by the the wi-fi connection and with something like like really all they can do until until ping times get shorter is you can like offset for latency and that's really it. And um, Jam Kazam, I saw this because you know uh, Dan, I don't know if you're aware, but our guitar player Tony, he lives in Chicago, and you know okay. you you've met you've mentioned during this conversation about you know we talked a little bit about um, 
about fostering those relationships and like supporting your bandmates and colleagues and doing the things that's going to be best for their, their, uh, you know, relationship ecosystem for their life ecosystem. And, um, so whenever, whenever he needs to do something like when he needed to move back to Chicago, you know, I was not going to stomp and throw a fit over that because it's going to be the mm -hmm. best thing for him to be close to his family, you know? So it's like, okay, instead of getting mad about it and resenting you for going away, it's like, let's just figure out a way to make it work where your life ecosystem is going to be in the best shape. So as yeah. a result of that, we've been trying to figure out ways to work remotely you know, we've done a little stuff with like garage band co collaborations. Fortunately, we started already working on this stuff before the pandemic hit. So we're, we're a little ahead of the curve in terms of being in a necessarily socially distant band. But yeah. um, I went and did some research into Jam Kazam, and they have this piece of hardware uh, called a, a jam blaster that's like an interface and it's also supposed to offset for latency. And I went and did research on it and they've been unable, to, like they have this huge surge in interest from the market, from people who are trying to get in there and access the technology, but they have this complete lack of funding uh, they, ha they have like zero capital to run it um, and have been unable to manufacture the uh, it, it, they've been unable to keep up in terms of bandwidth. They've been um, unable to manufacture more of the products, uh, the hardware to keep them functioning and uh, just because they can't generate the capital for it. And so it's been it's been a difficult challenge um for for us to overcome especially people who are trying to teach like you um so what have been some of the things that you've had to do to make the lag factor work in your in your lessons yeah i think i was well set up for it in that my first year in authority zero i was scrambling to pick up side gigs so i started teaching guitar lessons and a lot of my students weren't in colorado so i did i taught lessons over Skype and FaceTime. Um, and I think uh, sort of doing call and response, like setting up for the student that like, I'm going to show you this thing, then I'm going to play it, and then can you please play it back for me? And then trying to give them feedback on what you're seeing, which is really difficult um, if the connection's bad because just trying to see like where their fingers are, sometimes you can't tell which string they're on. Um, so I think working with the student and to adjust, you know, if you need to see more of the fretboard, asking them to, to, if they can adjust their camera a little to show you more of their hands so that you can give them feedback on that. Or, um, I think in general teaching over, um, video is more about finding ways to encourage them to sort of be in their own process with it. Right. Because you can't get as technical, right? Um, necessarily, I think a lot of it is just being a voice that and being a presence that's spending some time with them, and, um, and and just encouraging wherever they want to take it for the day. And sometimes I know I've had students. Sometimes that means that like you can sort of read in the student that like they're done, like th like twenty minutes in, thirty minutes in, they're like, burned they out. Don't like they're done and, and it's just, and it's, and it's getting frustrating for them and, and acknowledging that and being like, you know what? Like, I think this is good for today. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think during this whole process of quarantine, I know that's been important for me to sort of realize when I'm getting burned and when like, and just when my, my energy is just, when my system's getting a little hot and I'm getting frustrated or, um, and just to recognize that like pandemic is fucking tough. So yeah, much. well, I mean, it's a global collective trauma. Yeah. So you like know. giving yourself a break, like maybe 20 minutes is enough today. Maybe half an hour is enough today. Right. Right. Yeah. I've been, um, and, and Gordo, this is something that, 
that I was kind of want. I've been looking forward to talking to you about, and been looking forward to talking to you about too, Dan. Is um, I've been making an effort to shift my attention from a goal focus, from an outcome focus, to a process focus. Mm. You know, trying to create habits that are satisfying habits in and of themselves, you know, that will, that are in alignment with the outcomes that I desire. But right now we're living in a time where our outcomes are kind of fuzzy. You know, it's really hard to set a timeline on really anything right now. You know, it, it's very easy to, you know, put this idea of a record release and a tour and, and or in your case, you know, a, a, a production schedule or a show or a, or a movie or an audition, whatever you're looking for and like try and set that in the future. But we don't know when that's going to be. So, you know, like what I've been doing recently is it's like, OK, what's my daily practice going to be? It's like I'm going to do one video of one song and make it sound as good as I can and make it look as good as I can and put it out there. And that's going to be my practice or habits like I'm going to get on the bike with my kid or mm. I'm going to meditate in the car for the 10 minutes before I go in to work my shift, you know, take those things with the intention of, of, of reaching some outcome. But you know, I've been learning about this idea that the outcomes are not necessarily as earth-shaking as we kind of are hoping they will be. You know, if we, we're thinking they're going to be the end-all, be-all, we're inevitably going to be disappointed because people quickly adjust to outcomes and they just become, they move from being part of the experiential self to being part of the remembered self. Like instantaneously, mm. you know, and so so I've been focusing on that a lot. And I think that when it comes to doing lessons, I actually did my first lesson with Tony Gordo. I did my first You're lesson with Tony Lee. Me. No, I did, did my it? first I did my first lesson with him. And wow. it was a it was a phone lesson. And he's like, I'll tell you what to do. Because all I all I want to do is learn fundamentals. He's like, I've been told by people in my family, I've been told by all my friends that I'm a horrible teacher. But here's what you do. And, you know, I've been wanting to learn some, like, Travis picking country folk kind of guitar stuff. And uh, so, so Tony just kind of gave me an exercise to do. And he said, next time we get together, you know, he's like, in the meantime, just work on that every single day. And then if you can do it, the next time we talk, I'll give you something else. And that's mm -hmm. really it. You know, we had a conversation for a half hour and caught up and shot the shit and felt like human beings again. And then there's like, here's this thing to work on that'll get you a little bit better. You know, and I'm seeing that shift in process for a lot of people. What was the secret? Reveal his secrets. I need to know his secrets. You can tell me his secrets now. Literally, this is what Tony told me. He's like, this is how I got good at guitar. Is he said, I played along to, you know, like Stevie Ray Vaughan and B.B. King and all these people that I really liked, you know, and all, all the stuff that I was really into, played to the track over and over and over again. And then he had to, like, date himself. He's like, I would play to the tape. I mean, uh, or he's like, you're going to want to play to the tape. I mean, uh, the CD. I mean, uh, whatever the... The wave file, whatever you get. And, the real, the real. Yeah, the real, the real. And then I was like, the wax cylinder. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but so seriously, all he did is is he just started me out on like Travis picking exercises. He's like, he's like, do, uh, you know, f uh, four, five, three, f four, whatever it is, like just alternating the the A E D A E, you know, just do that over and over, just sit down and, and switch chords. And just when you're sitting in front of the TV, just keep doing that over and over and over again until you can carry on a conversation and do that at the same time without fucking up. 
And he's like, and then once you can do it on one chord, try and change chords. And then after that, you know, try it on different chords. And like literally just building the bass of the, the Travis picking style. That's it. He just gave me one fundamental to work on. And it makes sense. It yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Well, and that's that's become the thing, you know. And I think like Dan, what you're talking about about doing lessons is it's kind of like I play, you play, and then let's yeah. catch up and let's kind of talk about the theory and let's talk about the philosophy and let's just talk about what's going on in your life, you know. Yeah. I because, like hearing you talk about the the practice that you've been setting up for yourself in your day and making sure that it involves um, a moment to take care of yourself with meditation, a moment to take care of your kid riding the bike, like a moment to take care of your creative world, which is making a video and that whole process and, and then concentrate on just making each of those moments as good as they can be. And I think for me, one of the things I'm, I struggle with is I'm incredibly outcome driven like my Same. future brain, my future brain, my anxious future brain is what drives me. And and even though it is an anxious place for me, I enjoy that space with myself. And so not having that has been like, well, what do I work on? And um it's made me have to get creative in the conversations I'm having with other people. Um, around creating because I don't want to create by myself anymore. Right. I don't want like like I like. God, I hear I've you done, there. I've gone through periods of that for so long, and I I know I know for a fact at this point in my life that my best creative work does not happen alone. Oh, of course I need, not. I need of course other not. People. So th now this is this is kind of the the I I have always been a bit well I've been a very outcome driven person as well. And a lot of a lot of what I've learned over the last couple of years, I feel like I've picked up necessarily from a degree of depression that is formed from delayed outcomes or, mm. you know, like, oh, yeah, going to going to tour in Europe for the first time was something that I thought was going to be life changing for me. You know what I mean? And it was in a lot of ways, but it didn't fix everything and it didn't totally change the trajectory of my life you there's know there's always something else to do there's right always there's always other goals to be achieved there's always you know well there's, there's hedonic the step to be taken you know right and there's hedonic ap ap at. adaptation too which yeah. is no matter how good no matter how bad something is we're always going to adapt to it you know so i found myself just getting very dissatisfied with like going from project to project and getting depressed or getting anxious when things weren't working out. And now like, like it's like, you guys know how this is trying to work on any project around the holidays. You might as well quit. You might as well not do fucking anything because people always have stuff going on during the holidays and things get delayed and things get pushed back and, and people have prior commitments and, you know, at the end of the day, people are, for the most part, going to choose their their family and uh, their family commitments over anything else, for the most part. So the same thing goes for the pandemic is it's like. It's like I have absolutely no control, I have absolutely no ability to really affect or I only have a certain amount of ability to affect the timeline and expediency of anything that I'm working on. And even before the pandemic, I was looking for a way to kind of ameliorate those feelings of dissatisfaction or disappointment that I was dealing with. And Gordo has talked me off a cliff more than a few times. And this, this podcast has been very therapeutic for that. And I started to learn this idea of like learning to enjoy the process and trusting that if you show up and you do the process stuff, that it will eventually move you at least in the direction of the outcomes you have established as being important to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I, I mean? This, Go ahead. Yeah, I had this, I just had this thought last night. I was sitting out back and 
and sort of watching the sun slowly disappear. And I was thinking about like how, how lovely would it be if maybe just like the time and effort and how fucking hard I've worked at creating a creative life for myself over the last 15 years. What if I've already put enough in place that like, I, it can't not happen. What if right. all the work I've already put in just means that it will happen? There's no way that it cannot. And I can maybe trust in that, that it will find me without me needing to go and fucking kick down every other door. Right. Like I've been doing for so many years. What if there's a softer way to approach the work that still feels really rewarding and valuable? There's actually yeah. a concept called there's a concept and I forget what book this is from, but it's a it's a Zen concept of trying soft. Hmm. You know, the another another way I've heard sense because I mean like the longer you do something, the more opportunities you have to absorb, you know, what's coming your way. Like I don't know how better to say that. That was pretty it's pretty blundering, but uh, no, no, no. I but, I but totally you know get what, what you're I mean? saying. Like, if you keep if you just keep going, if you just keep doing it, like quitting just seems completely insane to me. Uh, even as long as I've been doing this, you know, um, and essentially what it comes down to is all the opportunities that I've gotten to do work um, have come through playing music, and they've all been really good things you know like i've gotten so many good things i've made so many good connections i've gotten actual paying work from being a musician you know i've, I've gotten other gigs i've gotten to know other people and work on right art and work on projects that i never thought i'd be that i never thought i'd be useful for <laughs> you know yeah. right yeah and it's and it's the but it's simply the longer you do it the more opportunities you see you know i mean opportunity looks a lot like hard work yeah, I guess. Well, there's yeah. there's um there was a uh, when I when we got to go on tour with uh, the Nitro Gods in Germany, I was talking to uh, Henny, the guitar player and um, one of the vocalists in that band. And and I mean, they're a pretty successful band in Europe. I mean, they tour their asses off. They they pack clubs, you know, most people haven't heard of them here, but the there's this whole other industry of music in Germany. And I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it firsthand, Dan, just like seeing the oh, difference yeah. in the industry there. But they're, I mean, they're, they're a successful band and we did a bus tour with them. And I remember one night we were, you know, we talked on the bus a lot and we were talking on the bus one night and, and we were having a discussion about the, the different insecurities and fears and, and things that, that go with, you know, the uncertainty of this business and, and the disappointment. And Henny said to me, he was like, he was like, well, but this is who you are and you will always do this. He's, he's like, it's in your blood. He's like, you're an entertainer. You're a musician. He's like, and there will be, there will be disappointments and there will be failures and, and, and women will run from you and, you know, because you never make any money, but at least you're never home and da 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 da. And he's like, he's like, he's like, you will always do Women this. Women will run from you. At least you're never home. I love that. Yeah, no, it was really good. You know, and I mean, of course, of course, the guys in my band, we all pri prioritize our relationships a little bit. I d I did keep that in because it was a very funny thing that he said, but, but it, you know, he was like, he was like, you will always do this. He goes, if it's if it's not this band, it'll be something else and opportunities will come and go and disappointments will come and go. But but this is this is part of who you are. You've always done it. And he didn't even yeah. I mean, Henny didn't know me that well. You know, we only went on tour together for 10 days, for God's sake. But we know each other. You know, yeah, we when, to... when we sit down together like this, we know each other in various Colleagues and contemporaries of ours have various levels of success and various different opportunities and come up that come up and the best of us wish them well and the worst of us wish them failure. And, you know, it it's 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 something that is going to like we're always going to do this no matter what. So yeah. if we just focus on the process of getting better and creating a body of work 
for no other reason besides it's fulfilling to do the work and I try to remember, and this is something that's been popping in my head a lot, I try to remember that I'm developing a body of work and a body of work takes a lifetime to develop. That's nice perspective to hear right now. Yeah. <laughs> We're all having a hard time, you know? Yeah. We all are. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I hope coming out of this, I, I hope we learn to like appreciate each other and appreciate community that we create and uh, like uh, a little more obviously maybe because sometimes the pessimist in me sees horrible things happen and then it's like well shit like we as humans didn't like I don't feel like we learned much from that horrible thing because then it just happened again and then it just happened again so one of the things I really hope I get to witness coming out of this is that people just get to enjoy each other a little bit more and take time to do that well because I think that's I, I think it's I think we forget sometimes to care for each other well right and and I and I understand your pessimism but what I try to remind myself is that we can't not be changed you know it's something that is always going to happen whether we want it to or not. And the world can't not be changed. It's like you look at something yeah. like like World War II, the Civil War, like it's, it's usually wars and disease are some of the worst things that have happened on this planet. And they completely change the function of civilization, the, the functionality of civilization. They completely change who we are as people. And it happens so collectively and pervasively and thoroughly and incrementally that it's difficult for us to step outside ourselves and take account with, with, without a deliberate process of doing so. You know, sometimes yeah. you have to like take a moment. My and, and I've mentioned this on the show before. I haven't been able to talk to my therapist in a while because I'm trying to pay off my bill. But... <laughs> Um, the, uh, w one of the things that, um, that she t has me do regularly when I'm feeling disappointed and feeling like a failure or feeling like a, like a joke or like I'm wasting my time or a hack or any of the number of mean things that our brain says to us. Anytime I'm feeling like that, she will put me in this position where I have to sit down and write down everything that I've achieved in the last five years. <laughs> you know awesome. what I mean? Like if you take the yeah. time to do that, you go, holy shit, I've done a lot of shit. And yeah, so no progress without disappointment. Right. And, and it's, it's important to, to, to acknowledge that we have acclimated to our successes. And if we're going to acclimate to all of our mm. successes and eventually feel disappointed again anyway, then we might as well try and find satisfaction in something else and just appreciate those war those rewards and those those successes and those opportunities when they do inevitably present themselves through the law of averages. Does that make sense? Man, yeah, we acclimate to our successes. I love how you said that. Because I think it's very true, and I think it becomes easy to discount things that uh, we've worked so hard to be at. But also, I've realized like if we sometimes I've gotten to places in my life that should have felt like a success in my mind, but in the moment I kind of hate it. Right. <laughs> and maybe it's because, and that and that's happened to me a lot. And I think maybe it's because. I, like I put too much pressure on myself in a moment or I want the moment to be perfect and no moment is perfect and we are never perfect. And one of the things I've been really working on 
with my therapist. Shout out to <laughs> shout out to therapists over like I just started. Therapists seeing, make the world go round. I hadn't yeah. seen my therapist in like three years and then like coronavirus and new girlfriend hit and I was like, Where are my fucking therapists? <laughs> 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 um yeah, yeah man. and uh, allowing and the very first session was pretty much me talking with him about and us discussing like my need and want to like have shit be perfect and it just and it isn't and that's not and one of the most brilliant things he said to me is that's not how we build trust with situations or people we build trust by showing up as who we are in a moment, which is normally like a little weird or, or whatever we're feeling that day. And then having people around us accept that person who showed up that day in whatever weird situation, that's how we build trust with ourselves and with other people around us and with situations is by showing up just as who we are from our warts insecure, and all secure, weird warts and all. And then when the world accepts you, that's when you learn to trust it. Well, it's like, you know, I've, I've mentioned, and that's, that is, that is very useful and profound. I mean, that's, that's very important to keep in mind. It, it, it's like, it's the same thing, like within a relationship, you know, a lot of people will try to avoid fights when in actuality they should fight as often as possible. But figure out how to do it well. Yeah. How yeah. To communicate like, have a hundred fights so you don't have to have yeah. one that ends the relationship or or a hundred communications right <laughs> communication right, right. sessions <laughs> like, right 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 know, like yeah it's it's a muscle that we need to exercise we need to learn how to have disagreements with each other it's really important and we need to learn how to um have empathy for each other and and allow people to come back from things they've said or things they've done. Like we. Well, cause you're yeah, a different not, person moment to moment. Yeah. And not expect people, including ourselves to be perfect and to handle situations perfectly or to think we know how to do fucking everything. Right. Who expects right, right. that we should know how to do everything. You know, like. The, it, one thing yeah. that's one thing that, 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 and, one thing that has come as the result to this point, something that has come as a result of doing my my daily video practice is I and I've mentioned this on the show before is like one of the most liberating concepts that you can come to is that nobody cares. You know, or rather that nobody is paying as much attention. Like nobody cares is the short way to say it, but the expanded version is Nobody is being as discerning to you as you think they are. Nobody is <laughs> watching for you to fuck up. Nobody is thinking about you 24 hours a day, like criticizing you your every move. Truman. Yeah, you're yeah, not, you are not You're not Truman. You have – people are living their own lives, and you have a tremendous bandwidth for failure. You have a tremendous bandwidth for experimentation. And especially people like us who are in underground and independent music. I mean, you know, Dan, you're in a you're in a well known and successful band, but even still, like, you know But I still do a ton of other like I've got this solo acoustic project that like like that is a, a huge piece of my heart and soul. But and you're also, no but you're also, about it. my like, point is, is you're also <laughs> not, I'm here. you're not, you're not Kesha. You know what I mean? You're no, not the president of the no. United States. You're not, you're not a person for whom the world is watching every move. You have a tremendous yes. amount of bandwidth to, to experiment and try things out and doing can this I, day. Can I break in here and just ask a simple question? Yeah. Uh, just a, about this whole thing. One thing that has drawn my attention is I like inevitably am more on social media than I need or want to be during this thing. Right. Like I when you see things pop up about like, you know, like Hillary Duffy's pancakes or uh <laughs> Hillary like, I, Duffy. I, I love I that you called her I Hillary Duffy. But you know what what whoever it is, I, that's my point. Is that like I mean like whatever. It's like <laughs> this kind of celebrity culture thing. 
Right. Is, is like, she is she dead? <laughs> <laughs> that's no, I good, swear. That's another good headline, that, though. I swear. That's another. That's another good headline, though. It's like, is Hillary Duffy? Dead? Is Hillary but, Duffy dead? If Gordo, if like... Gordo ran a celebrity <laughs> gossip site, that's the headlines you would see. God forbid. But I'll tell you what. And here, and here's her pancake recipe. But, but I was just kind of wondering. It's like with all this stuff going on and all the, you know, like kind of mini dramas that we're involved in in our own lives and our own houses or whatever, you know, is going on. Like, does this stuff matter? Just, you know, it's like, <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like this kind of, they're, they're trying to create this, uh, this, you know, celebrity culture. And I wondered like, who, who's, who's following that? Are people still really into that stuff or, or are people prioritizing a different kind of, you know, like, that's a, I mean, that's a good, that's a fair question. You know? I don't know. Like, I, you know, Axel, Axel Rose's, you know, bre chosen breakfast cereals are, I, I, I don't know. Like, anything I, like that. I have chosen to like I have changed my relationship with with social media a little bit and in that you know and I've criticized social media on this show a bunch you know and I I bemoan it all the time and 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 it's one of my favorite things to bitch about and in, in how it's you know changed the world and undermining uh, political discourse and and creating uh probably the most upsetting thing is how it's it's driving decision making in the world because of the tirades of a very noisy two percent but what i have done is is i've gotten really good about curating my feed and keeping it to stuff that keeps me connected to people i care about and connected to content that i enjoy i am all for anyone doing whatever helps to alleviate their stress right now as long you know as long as they're not doing any harm and and some people like celebrity culture like pop culture is their hobby you know what i mean like some people they want that stuff and now See, but that's i'm kind of slowed down now right though so like what you know where, where are we at with that? You know, I'm a fan of movies, art, music, you know, and, and I want to see, you know, like sometimes maybe I do want to see, you know, what James Hetfield is, is drinking in terms of coffee. Maybe maybe I want to see that, you know, <laughs> I can't see that right now. Maybe, you know, I mean, I would I, I would I would scroll by it. I would be like, you know, taking a <laughs> shit, whatever, and be like, huh, James Hetfield's drinking coffee like, you know, He's a I think he's a vanilla latte guy. <laughs> I'll bet he is. He looks he like a vanilla be. latte guy. I wonder yeah. if he's stuck up in Aspen. During vale. The he's in Vale. Oh, oh, he's in Vale. He's in Vale. Oh, of course, he's in Vale. Yeah. Hey, he I wanted to. Of, um, he was sick of the elitists in in uh, the Bay Area. <laughs> in L.A. So he you wanted to, to get. Vail. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted sure. to share something with you guys. So, um, so one of the things that. Uh, because I do, I do have a sort of speaking of side hustles. I do have a, uh, a like a side gig as as a coach. Like I I offer my services out as a coach specifically for artists and musicians, like our people. That's something that I specifically, you know, a, a group that I enjoy serving. I've really quit trying to make a business out of it. It's more as just like I just stir it into the pot of of my role in the community. You know, uh, trying to help help people out and impart wisdom and ask the right questions whenever I can. But in, as part of my training, I had this this exercise given to me, and we talked about process, and it's this logical levels exercise that like takes you through these various levels of ab abstraction in thinking about a, a, like a project that you're working on. So it starts at like this higher idea of abstraction of like your your vision for what you want the outcome okay like you think about a goal that you have in mind you think about something out in the future that you want to do and you really put together a vision of that and then you start to like really flesh it out by breaking it down on the first logical level is like 
who all benefits from it, okay? Who is affected by it? Who is it for? Who are all the, the, the players in this? Who is going to be directly if affected by it? And then it goes down to another like more tangible level, which is, is this idea of identity, okay? Who do you need to be for this? Like, what kind of person would you be if you accomplished this? Who will you become when? Like, you start to, like, flesh out this, these ideas of the person that you're, you're going to be. And then it goes down to a, an even more material idea, which is, you know, what values are present in this? Why is it important to you? What about it is important? Why is it meaningful to you? You know, you start to flesh out the, 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 the meaning within the goal. And then um, it breaks down to uh, what kind of skills do you need? What, what kind of capabilities do you need? Um, you know, how will you go about achieving that? What skills do you have? What skills do you need to develop? Again, we're getting more and more tangible as we go into this, more and more material. And then it breaks down to like action steps and behaviors, like what actions need to be taken, what steps could you take to support X? Um, what, what, are, what are your action steps, one, two, three, for working this out? And then the very last thing, it's the very last level, plan. say goal that plan. again? Goal plan. Yeah, like your goal plan, yeah. And then the very last thing is, okay, where and when are you going to do it? And then that becomes your work. Like your work is just like the action steps that you are going to take and where and when you are going to do them. Mm -hmm. And the idea is just like, focus on those things, focus on those particular daily, weekly, monthly habits and work on those in service of this vision that you've set for yourself, this vision for your life that you've set for yourself with the knowledge that it will change as you move towards it. You know what, yeah. I, I used to work on uh, like a goal plan like that with all the clients that I had, like back in Kansas when I worked with people with disabilities, people with traumatic brain injuries, like we would do these all the time. Right. And I learned a lot about myself through like just kind of learning how to do it with other people. Mm -hmm. And I actually started figuring out how to structure my own goals and my own action steps and all of right. that stuff. It was pretty cool. Now, as a teacher, Dan, I'm sure that like working with these kids has been something that has helped you develop as as a player for one cuz the, the 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 best way to learn what you know about your instrument is to try and teach it to other people. But uh, what, what are you learning? What are you learning about yourself? Like, what, what are some of the things that you've been learning from working with these kids in a teaching capacity? Well, to, to be fair, I've only I only started last week and I've had my first two lessons. But I but I have been working. That's a good with sample. A variety of. Well, but I have been working with youth in a, a bunch of different capacities over the past, like, five to ten years with um, like. Uh, shout out to Vocal Coalition and 303 Choir and Travis Brenham and then volunteering over at a Children's Hospital and working with Youth on Record. Um, and I think in general, like, I, what I've learned from working with kids is that it gives me a lot of joy. So why don't I try to structure more work that I do in the world around joy? And right. just that feeling of like what am I creating in the world and how is it joyful? And it's been interesting actually in how that doesn't necessarily align. I, I've had, been having a hard time making that align in a lot of ways with my punk rock self because a lot of my punk rock songs and ideas are around like I'm going to tell a story about something tragic and I'm going to yell it at you and then hope that that changes the world. And I've done that a lot over and over and over. And while I do think that I've created like moments of great coming together and energy, I think 
moving forward in my life, one of my big goals is I want to create more joy. And so I have this new project I'm working on called Big Hearts Club with me and uh, Jakob from Slow Caves and um, and with uh, Greg from Wheelchair Sports Camp. He's been playing drums with us oh, a cool. little bit. And um, yeah, and we got this really cool guy, um, James Doviak, who um, he, producing the project. So he, he plays guitar and keys for Johnny Marr and produces those records. And it's been, it's basically like writing like 80s inspired pop music. That is so fucking cool. That's super around, fun. Around the idea of like, I want to write songs that make people dance. That has been my goal every time we're writing and every time we're listening to a mix and every time we're adding something is like, does it make me dance? Will it make other people dance? Right. Like, right. And that's such a fun fucking goal. I love this goal. I like it brings me joy to have this joyful goal. Right, like, right, right. It's fucking awesome, and it does. So, so in one of my kind of like guiding mantras is find joy, bring joy. Like mm. that's that's one of my that's one of my guiding missions in life is is that was the guiding principle behind the porterhouse remix. <laughs> I we had to give you some context, Dan. Yeah, I had we, we had a bunch of people do um we put a bunch of stems from some of our new recordings up on SoundCloud and we did this thing called the Ruckus Remix Challenge and we got a bunch of people to do remixes of our of our songs and Gordo did this one called the Porterhouse remix of one of our songs and it was it had me dying. The video uh the video's on our Facebook. I think it's on you. I, I need to actually get it on YouTube because I did a live one, but then didn't, didn't save the video. But uh, yeah, the, the the remix that Gordo did was hilarious. The Porterhouse remix. Anyway, <laughs> so find find yeah, find joy, bring joy has been um, kind of a mission of mine within the last five years, I would say, since deliberately uttering it. And yeah. it, especially like we had to, as a band, um, we had to decide on a new why for our band when we started all getting into committed relationships and having children and and some of us sobering up and just growing up, you know. And so we had to yeah. find something else besides, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll and party, 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 party. So, you know, a big part of our mission became this whole idea of find joy, bring joy and... Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to reconcile that with songs that are angry or, you know, just uh, nasty or, uh, you know, vulgar or um, lustful in some way or 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 just immature, silly dick and fart songs. But there is especially with with anger and, and with the type of music that you're doing in in the punk rock world is there is joy in catharsis. Yeah. You know, the people well, who go I to will say too. go ahead. Sorry. And I, and I will say too, like as far as lyrics go that I think are filled with ideas of joy, I think Jason in authority has always written songs from a place of a lot of like trying to provide hope and joy for people. Like I, I have right. learned a lot from his process of writing and from being around him and watching him engage with the punk community and from watching him create, like he tries to do that from as big a place of joy or with the idea of like not hurting people with his messages or with what he's doing. Uh, like, I think he, I think he does that as well as anybody. And I think I've learned from that. Um, there is something joyous to, in getting together collective uh, the getting together in a group and collectively shining light uh on the monsters in the closet you know yes and i and i think i think one of the things that's been hard for me as i've gotten a little bit older and and been doing been playing and touring and making records in the punk rock community for 15 years is sometimes that group of people doing that looks like 
a lot of like it looks too much to me like like a bunch of like straight white men in a room run, like agreeing with doing, each other agreeing with each other <laughs> about about what about no but that's kind of even if it's punk rock like sometimes that room to me looks too much like that and 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 it's a room that is not as interesting for me maybe as it used to be or or looks or feels different to me than it did when I was younger or um I want to I want to hang out in some different rooms. I want to have some different conversations. I want to yeah. And to do that sometimes we have to change what that room looks like or where that room is or what the sound looks like or or who's invited to speak there or and fortunately we're living in a time where all the rooms have been closed down. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, which is fucking rad. Like, so well, it, so your identity, all of our identities are being collectively challenged right now. Because yeah. there's so much of our identity that has been influenced by our environment and we're spending a lot more time in kind of a focused environment. You know, it's it's you and your immediate loved ones and yeah, the people you interact with on social media and the people that you're calling, but but really you know, for many of us, especially in the entertainment world, our tribes have gotten a little smaller for the time being. Yeah. You know, and we're really getting to see who I don't we know. are. Speak for yourself, Aaron. I'm hanging out with my buddies here. <laughs> <laughs> I got Sting. Okay, this is Shaggy over here, all right? Oh, it's Sting and Shaggy. That's who that is. Apparently, I took a picture of this painting in Curacao, and it was just, it was just so bad it was good, and so I had to take a picture of it. Sorry. Hey, Continue. what do you say we give a shout-out to our sponsors? <laughs> Let's do that. Do it. I Let's do that. You. All right, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Let me get down to the thing here. Okay, so first and foremost, our most venerable, nay, venereal sponsor, Matula Plumbing. Matula! Matula! Shit rolls downhill. Don't be at the bottom. Your number two is our number one priority. Your shit is our bread and butter. Angie's List Super Service Award winner back in 2011. One one is the only one that matters. After that, it got all political. Political. And where are the booties for you? Go get your pipes pumped out, bitch. Whoa. Dude. Wait, no, that wasn't Matula. That was Mutiny. <laughs> that was Matula. <laughs> okay, Mutiny. Sorry, I had the wrong thing up. This is the Matula card. This is the Mutiny card. Okay. Mutiny Let's Information Cafe. <laughs> Mutiny Information Cafe at 2 South Broadway. Books, records, coffee, live events eventually, podcasts. Uh, right now, mostly coffee and mail order, but they've um, they've got a hole in one of the boards over their windows, and they're doing lots of coffee for the neighborhood. And uh, if nothing else, go down there to check out all the art that people have done on the wood panels outside the windows. This is a mutiny Very transmission. Cool. We love mutiny. Tell them the boys sent you. Flipside music down off of South Acoma Street. Uh, oh, the wait, largest... can, I, can, we, can we back up just a second? Yeah, absolutely. I, I asked a question about mutiny last week, and I have an answer this week. Oh, okay. Okay. So, what's the question about, about mutiny? It's it's. Can you order records? Yeah. Can you order books? What'd you yes. find out? Yes, you can. Do they have everything on Discogs or what? Uh, it's all on their web page. All their books, all their records. Probably not their used stock, used stock, but they have the. Uh, the new ones up there. Hmm. Well, that's great. And, mutiny yeah. info cat mutiny information mutiny info cafe dot com. Go check them out. Order some books. Order some records. Order some. Oh, you know what they made? Um, this is something that they did recently, and I want to give a shout out. I want to give a shout out to um Luke Schmaltz. He just put out uh, his yeah. book, The Belcher, um, on Mutiny Mutiny Press. Uh, they published his book. They did an ebook on the Belcher. I just talked to Luke the other day. I want to get him on the show once. Uh, 
once the audio book comes out and I get a chance to listen to it. Um, but they just put that out and uh, they did, along with that, they did some sort of Belcher cross-branded Denver Joe coffee roast. Like they did their own coffee roast and it's like a Denver Joe roast. Go to mutinyinfocafe.com um, and check it out for yourself. Uh, yeah, Flipside Music, uh, largest selection of effects pedals in the region, if not the world. Um, and also check out their YouTube series, What the FAQ, on YouTube. Uh, we had Ike on the show. It was a great episode. He's a super rad guy. I love him lots. Um, Rocket Space Rehearsal Studios. Uh, eventually, people will be able to get back in there and start jamming again. Um, I'm really excited. Do they have any of their new uh, logo on their merch? Do I don't know. Merch, stuff? Have they done That's, any? Have they done any merch I yet? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I don't That's know. a good I question. I will answer that question. Tune in next week when, when Gordo I answer my own goddamn questions. On That's the what MF you're podcast. here for. Hey, <laughs> we love Kate Rocket Space Rehearsal Studios. Check them out. Evergroove Studio in Evergreen, Colorado. The uh, the official recording studio of Motherfucking Ruckus and any band who knows what the fuck they're doing. Um, beautiful views high atop Black Mountain and uh, 70% solar powered, friendly, uh, informed, professional staff and just the best place you could hope to make a record. Go to evergroove.com, uh, hit Brad and Jenny up about your next project. Uh, Burn TV Studios, this podcast and a whole bunch of other great content come to you from Burn TV Studios at an undisclosed location in the Rhino District of Denver, Colorado. Um, we just released a couple new episodes of the 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 Doc with Red Man, which was a lot of fun. Um, that guy is fucking hilarious, uh, and our lead animator Jamie Jorgensen is is a genius. So uh, we've been putting some cool stuff out. Stay tuned for uh, tons of great content from the Nug Nation at the NugNation.com. Um, and then, of course, big shout out to the people who back us via a recurrent contribution on patreon.com slash mfruckus. You guys make the goddamn world go round. And you guys are keeping us afloat during this, seriously. Like, the only reason we're able to keep operating is because of our patrons and all the people who have been buying merch off of the uh, COVID out of business sale. Um, I should mention that. Go to big cart or go to mfruckus.bigcartel.com. Enter the promo code COVID at checkout and get 15% off everything in the store. Um, but yeah, you patrons, the people who are backing us, uh, you guys are keeping us alive. We've got, I've got a music video in the works for every single song off the new album. And, um, and and they're all going to be really cool. We're very excited about it. Uh, we're working on long distance jamming stuff, so building some content that way. Uh, doing new stuff with the podcast, um, more comics, and uh, s paying for studio time because we've got 17 songs worth of drum drum tracks in the can that we're getting ready to release soon. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. If you're just joining us, we're here with my guest Dan Aid from authority zero um i want to talk to you dan a little bit with the with the remainder of the time i want to talk to you a little bit about how you came on my radar back when uh you were in letters from the front and i heard this story about this band in town with a one-armed guitar player who played with a popsicle stick strapped to his strumming arm with the guitar pick on it. And I remember I remember thinking to myself that just like just like there's no way like how do the mechanics of that even work? And then I like heard recordings of your playing and you made the comment earlier about being a perfectionist, but it's like you have this sound that no one else could possibly have as a result of you making the best out of a suboptimal situation. And I've always been curious about what the fuck drives a guy with one arm to want to play the guitar. Like, was it because you 
wouldn't think you'd be able to do it or did you play it before like i don't know the whole story can you tell me a little bit about that yeah so i played before which was you played I think, before was part of oh yeah jesus so, christ so my dad got my dad got me a guitar for christmas a little uh like quarter, half size montana acoustic when i was eight years old and then i um uh yeah i, I lost the hand when i was 12 so and I hadn't played that much. I'd sat down with my dad and um, and he had these old uh, this old red. He had one red notebook and one blue notebook where he'd gone through and he'd written all the lyrics to like his favorite like Dylan tunes and stuff like that. And then <laughs> That's he'd written so the cool. chord changes over it. And he so he taught me just basic open chords and that was bas- That's what I knew a little bit. But I grew up um, like singing and playing because that's what my dad did. He would sing and play so I thought that's just what you did when you played guitar um but yeah then after um after having the amputation and coming back home um from the hospital I think it was a lot of just figuring out like what what did I want to figure out right do that I'd done before and what was going to work and what wasn't and and fortunately guitar was something that through a lot of trial and error started to feel like maybe it could be a thing. And that's where punk rock was so, so valuable to me at like 12, 13 years old was because at first the system we had was really loose and kind of janky and I could only down strum. Okay. Cause I could only provide pressure with my arm coming down on the strings. And, uh, and so I remember just listening to green days insomniac and then learning like a power chord shape in my left hand. Yeah. Yeah. And no, and, and having some friends at school that, that knew the song, no pride that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I am just a mutt and nowhere is my home. What did that? So, so anyway, um, I think it's just three chords. I think it's like G and D and C. And then, um, but like learning, Playing along to Green Day songs was the first time that I felt like I was like, oh, like it, it kind what what I'm doing kind of sounds like the record, and nothing else did that. Like when I tried to play along to like a Rage Against the Machine song or like eh, Bad Religion or anything else, like I it didn't work. But with Green Day, it kind of worked, and that was the power of it. Is it like it it, it encouraged me because what I was doing kind of sounded like the record. It was like, maybe I can do this. Right. And um, so that's where it started, and it just kind of progressed from there. And then at one point, uh, when I was in middle school, I took a couple months of guitar lessons from this guy, Stu Lippa, this, like, Italian guy with, like, long, curly 80s hair and, like, this total <laughs> shredder hey, guy. Hey, I'm Stu Lippa. Stu Lippa's guitar lessons. Come on down. I'll teach you a thing or two. I think he still teaches and he was just this sweetheart of a guy with like a lot of cats and, uh, <laughs> and, and, but he was the guy that sat me down and I had never thought it ever that I would be able to like play solos or riffs or anything, but he taught, he started to teach me like ACDC and, uh, Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. And, and that was when I started to think of myself at, with the one hand as, maybe being able to like play stuff on individual strings. And that's what started to open up that world for me. And, um, and it's just kept going. Like I still work on new things all the time. One of my newest challenges is trying to figure out listening to, um, like Greg Rian Isakoff or tallest man on earth, or people are doing finger picked stuff in the right hand. Right. My new challenge for myself is, is, is how to make that work. Yeah. And what's cool is I can. It's really hard. I'm like trying to imagine <laughs> it though. Like, like help me understand the mechanics because I'm trying to imagine it. Like how I use my, I use my elbow, basically how you use your wrist. It's like using a sledgehammer to to like. I don't know. To do the job that you would use like a, a like a claw for. hammer with. Yeah, I mean it's like. But I've I've figured out how to like you make really intricate movement with 
with the elbow and sort of know where the pick is in space in that way that like it's it's not easy <laughs> no but see but that's what's what's, but, what's truly amazing about it is this is i remember i was listening i think it was something a, a wire dogs release that you did and i remember listening to the guitar playing on it and i was taken by how the velocity of your strumming was so unique you know this isn't like this isn't like a story of like you know boy in a small town like figures out how to you know get by without the use of his hand like it's like you're a very competent player like it's not just like it's not like John Prine singing after throat cancer. It's like, oh, he's still able to make noise. You know what I mean? It's like, and we love him because he's John Prine. So the character yeah. in his in his post cancer voice is like endearing to a certain degree. It's like you were a sure. very technically proficient and competent player. And what it sounds like is that Thanks. as you built your competence with your playing your confidence around your playing began to grow too. And so then that emboldened you to go, okay, well, what else is possible? What else can I do with the equipment that I've got? And then it ended up creating something that has really become your signature sound. And Oh, thanks. I mean, that this is just my observation and like listening to your music and seeing the trajectory of your career going from Letters from the Front to White Leather to Wire Dogs to Authority Zero, which is, you know, which is like that is that's quite an achievement to get to get into that position. And and it seems like you've even become kind of sought after as as a very competent and masterful musician and i've always just like i wanted to get you on the show so bad because like <laughs> that just seemed like such an amazing like that was just such an amazing thing to me and i've always like from a distance observed that and thought of it as just an incredibly amazing thing you know thanks aaron yeah no, thank course. you thank you so much for saying all that like for me i mean Again, like the idea of maybe downplaying ourselves, but like the idea of me as a master of guitar feels really laughable because like I still don't know my scales. I still don't know so many things about how to play my instrument. And I think for me, what has made the difference in, in allowing myself to have the opportunities that I've had is that I really, I think I've asked for them. Um, I gave a talk over at Dime Music School last year. Um, they're, they're, I think, partnered with the music program at Metro Denver now. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and the topic of that for me was the big ask, because I think asking for what we want out of life in a way that is going to actually help us move towards that goal is really valuable. And I think I've figured out how to sort of be clear with myself about some of the things I want and then how to go about asking for those things. And with guitar, like I wanted to play in a big internationally touring rock band. Right. And how do so, I go about doing that? So I asked for that. Right. And it, and it meant that, and it, and what it meant, honestly, when I showed up on day one of rehearsals with authority is that I was scared out of my fucking mind because like I'd never, I'd never really played I I'd never really played solos before. I I I I mean not fast complicated shreddy ones like in their music. Like right. the guy I was replacing Brandon is one of the best guitar players in punk rock hands down. Like his strumming, his his technical capability is fucking phenomenal and I was like I am not that player. So but what do I bring to the table and how can I um make this into like, how can I step into this role in the best way possible? And it was a big learning experience for me. And just knowing that I wasn't going to be able to be like the guy who'd done the job last. So I had to figure out how I was going to do that. And it made me become such a better player. I'd also never played guitar 
like necessarily where I was the only guitar player in the band. Right. So not having another guitar player to like rely on to sort of pick up your slack when if you like hit a bad note or if you fuck up a chord or any of that. Right. You know, it was just this whole other education for myself in how to just do this thing. And it made me be better. So I think asking for something that I wasn't sure if I could do. And then when I was given the opportunity to have that job to be like, okay, now I got to fucking figure it out. I think that's such a valuable lesson. Like we were talking about earlier, just risking like, like I am, I am not, I think you said Kesha or the president. (laughs) I am not Kesha or the president. The spotlight is not on Dan. Like, right, right, right. Like, like Dan can afford to, to, to fall. And I have, like I've stepped into situations and like, fucking felt like I failed pretty hard, but it made me show up the next day and know my shit. And I think right. unless we give ourselves the opportunity to show up in those really scary situations where like, we know we're going to fail and it, and in entertainment where we know we're going to step on a stage in front of like, maybe like 200 to 10,000 people and fail. Ooh, that's terrifying. But also like how exciting, how fucking there, liberating. There's something to be said for putting yourself in a situation that you where you're out of your depth. Now obviously, you you don't want someone who is in a position of authority or, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, the highest office in the land or anything like that. You know, you don't want someone like that stepping in where they're out of their well, actually that's not out true. of their depth. No, no, no. That's that's the thing is is there is an amazing thing about when when you step into something that is out of your depth and rising to the occasion. Yeah. You know, there's something to be said about surprising yourself when you put yourself in, in a situation that you are not prepared for. You do not feel you would be able to do, you know, and then, but it's make it or break it or make it or break it time. And you got to do something and even if you totally eat shit, you surprise yourself with what you accomplish. You surprise yeah. yourself with how well you actually do do. You know? Oh, yeah. It's not as good as you would like it to be, but it's also not as bad as you thought it would be. Man, yep. I've stumbled a million times, and now I've got Sting and Shaggy in my band. <laughs> <laughs> We're going straight to the top. Straight to the top. They should you should pitch a remake of the three amigos with you three. <laughs> It'd be like Sting, Shaggy, and some asshole <laughs> made a record. No, it, it it's just it's interesting though, cause like, you know, you, you you talk about it's like I can't play these shreddy solos and I I can't do this stuff and blah blah blah, but there are things that you can do. There are sounds that you can create. There is a signature sound to the way that you play that I could try for a hundred years and I would never be able to sound like Dan Aid. Oh, thanks, man. That you know, feels so good to hear because I feel like, like I think the actor part of me that has been an actor since I was really young always has tried to look at the people that I really loved and imitate what they do. So I feel like I've spent a lot of my career really lost in like trying out, trying on other people's costumes, trying on the Green Day costume or trying on the Clash costume or trying on and just and so it feel it's really, really nice to hear that in me trying on those costumes, you've heard something that is felt distinctly me. And I think that the more records I've done and the older I get, the more comfortable I get in the idea that what I'm creating can be distinctly me so thank you, you for telling me that of course and and while you're while you were talking about that it 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 made something pop into my head that that and i'll share this with you is um you know as someone from the acting world as well you know or an acting background anyway and as someone who has done the same thing of like trying to try on these different 
pieces of identity. And it really sucks that I'm almost 40 before I, I figured this shit out or began to develop a knowledge about it is um, there's this thing that happens. I don't know if it happens as much with guitar players. I'm sure it happens with guitar players, but it really happens a lot with singers because we listen to other singers and then we imagine singing something a certain way and there's a voice in your head that sounds a certain way and then you process that through your actual physical equipment and it doesn't come out the way it sounds in your head and so many of the singers that I know uh, and, and I, I know that this is true for me is it's like I don't like the sound of my singing voice mm. I don't like the way I sound on recording. Like I have trouble listening back to things. I just don't like the way it sounds. It sounds good while I'm doing it maybe. But then when I listen to it back, I don't care for it. And one night I'm at work and I, you know, I kind of work with a bunch of crunchy hippie types and they're very sweet, endearing, lovely people. Crunchy hippie types. No, they're wonderful people. And one of the one of the crunchier gals on our staff is <laughs> is working and she's helping me close down. And I put on, I had like some Thin Lizzy playlist going and a Dio song came on and I'm singing along and, and I just said, I was like, God, I wish I could sing like Ronnie James Dio. Mm. And then she said, well, yeah, but then you wouldn't sing like Aaron Howell. Mm. You know what I mean? And that conversation I think was more impactful than, and more profound than I think she had really realized at the time, but since then I've been really trying to listen to other people's stuff for reference. Yeah. But then go, okay, how does Aaron Howell sing this? Yeah. You know, and finding people to put around you that like can help sort of produce you to do what you do, I think is I've just found that this year in one of the biggest ways. This guy, Jakob, who, uh, from Slow Caves, who I've been writing this Big Hearts Club, these tunes right, with. Right, 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 right. For this Big Hearts Club project. I, I never knew that my voice could sound the, w the way it does when we work on these songs. Because of how he inspires me to sing these vocal lines, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I feel like, Oh my God, I'm singing like me, but in all the ways that I've always wanted, like in with all the, the weirdness and the angst and the emotion and the mel and the melodic parts are just coming. It's all like, but I, but it wouldn't have happened if someone else didn't help me get there. Right. And that, and that goes back to that piece of what I was saying earlier. It's like, I know the best creative work I do. I don't do alone. Right. Right. And and also the the uh, the other side of that coin is I think it is important to advocate for your strengths. Yes. To know and advocate your strengths. It took me forever to convince to speak up about wanting things to be transposed. Yeah. You know, Tony likes to give me shit about using a capo. You know what I, I mean? Capos. Capos, Me too. One fret, one fret can make such a difference. It such can. A difference. So such a I, difference. I've been doing a lot of stuff, Tony a lot with a lot of the. Himself, man. Yeah. Capos are where it's at. <laughs> well, I've been... shit about using a capo too, and I'm going to tell that guy. I'll tell you right now, Tony. Forget <laughs> it. I'm not putting down that capo. This thing, pry it from my cold dead hand. <laughs> it's it's great for songwriting, man. They're great. And and so good. So what Perfect I tool. so tool. like I mean it's a great tool and it's like um you know like I'm in this Oingo Boingo project and I had to go to that entire band and go hey we need to take this down a full step or it's not going to sound as good it's like mm -hmm. I am not physically built like Danny Elfman my voice doesn't sound like Danny Elfman's but I can do a good job of Danny Elfman's songs if we put them in a place where my voice is it where it's suited to my voice's sweet spot and i think i um i tried for a lot of years to do songs in their home keys or home tuning or tried to sing them like the original artist 
and I was doing myself a disservice and doing damage to my voice, yeah. you know, by trying to sing like someone that I'm not. And since I have been doing this project where I've been forced into an uncomfortable situation of, you know, well, I mean, I'm not forced to play guitar on video and put it on the internet, but I am, if I want to keep making music, I am forced to do stuff by myself. And if I want to yeah. perform for people, I'm forced to do things by myself. And what it has done is it's made me go, how can I play this where it's going to sound best for my voice? And so I experiment with tunings and I experiment with using a capo and I, you know, I use um, like the ultimate guitar tab uh, website and experiment with using uh, their transposition tools and things like that. And it is, it has made me a better singer and it's made me more confident and competent in mm. my skill set. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah. That's um, awesome. Well, hey man, we're uh, we're coming up on two hours here, and cool. uh, I think I think for Skype podcast, like if you were here in the room, we would probably go three or four hours. Yeah, but I gotta take a piss and get a snack. So <laughs> yeah, the, and <laughs> don't uh, we all? Yeah, don't we all? So hey Dan, um, I really want to say thank you for taking the time to come on and hang out and talk. It's been really cool. I. We've always had kind of a, a casual acquaintanceship and and it's been really nice to take our relationship to the next level. And so it's yeah. it's been great having you, man. When all this is over, I would love to get together and have a uh have a drink of something, um and uh sit around and shoot the shit and uh maybe even jam, who knows? But I and I'd love to see you play. Um more yeah. than anything. I'd love to come see you play. I'd and I'd like uh, to see that too. Yeah, it's good to get to know you, man. Yeah, same, Gordo. And uh, Aaron, thank you so much for reaching out and for sticking with me as I push this and push this. And um, yeah, I, it was funny when this started. Like you popped up, and the first thing that came into my mind is, um, you remember when MF Ruckus played that like snowboard on the block event? Yeah, absolutely. And you like did the whole thing in like a little banana hammock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Actually, for um, that one, I wore the I wore the boy brief. Oh, the boy brief. Yeah, I wore the boyfriend brief on that one. Okay, okay, but in my in my head, like that was such an endearing moment in my world. And uh, anyway, <laughs> hey, I appreciate that. It's like I saw you in your underwear one time. It was very endearing. I've liked you ever since I saw you in your underwear. I like most people after I see them in their underwear. Um, <laughs> no, man, I just. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's been lovely and thanks for having me on and, of course and yeah but uh do me a favor yeah. and uh before we sign off here let everybody know where they can find you where they should look for you what you're going to be up to next all your links and and the doodads and the slap yeah. it on the bing bong all that yeah uh just danade.bandcamp.com as all my solo stuff and then spotify if you want to check out dan aid my last name's A I D is in dog, and then Authority Zero is on Spotify and YouTube and all that. And, um, and then if you want to check out the new season of Good Girls, I'm in episode nine. I play a hitman. You play uh, a hitman? All cool. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, and if you want to check out Smilf, I play a tattoo artist in the second season. So that's what I got going on. And um, yeah, keep. Keep an ear out for uh, Big Hearts Club. It'll be coming at you soon. Cool, man. I'm really looking to hear. I'm really looking forward to hearing it, man. And uh, you're, you're a hell of a swell guy. And um, and keep doing everything that you do, man. And uh, do your best to stay sane. And uh, if you need to talk to anybody or or anything like that, feel free to reach out, man. I got your back. You're part of Thanks, you're man. part of the club now. Thanks, man. All right. <laughs> Hey, All right, guys. Take thanks, care. thanks everybody for watching the podcast. This has been episode 104. We're still working during the goddamn pandemic. It's a fucking pandemic. We're still having a goddamn podcast, motherfucker. Yeah. Can't keep us down. We're still doing it. Little doing microscopic it. bug. It's like we're like Da Vinci during the plague, man, or Michelangelo, or one of those. <laughs> I don't know who was there in the plague. Yeah, take that pandemic.
That's a souffle I made. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a pan of delicious. You, <laughs> that's pan, Spanish for bread. It's way too much cheese, man. <laughs> Hey, Nobody this has been episode 104 much. of the motherfucking podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. We love you guys. Blah. Wee blah. Ding dong. Stop recording.